the stage, we sort of looked at why you want to go about attacking an act and who might be interested. And now, we just want to look at a few things that an attacker might look at, things that you can use to do if you wanted to attack a mobile application. So, first of all, is what's in your local storage. Most applications don't operate without needing to store something. Sometimes there's a server you can connect to, but if you want to offer something with more fine functionality, then you're going to need to store it somewhere. So what is being stored becomes very relevant. I mean, it could be something that directly you can steal and is valuable to you, like some of these credit card details if you're allowing them to make payments. But it could also be something like maybe you've got a long-term session cookie that's just going to be access to an application over time. Some people get that. They've got access to your account on the server. So that becomes a problem. And a lot of these things are going to be needed, so we can't just say, oh, don't store that. So the concern then becomes, how are they stored? If you've got them on CreateText on your device, basically that's it. It might take a little bit of time, and you'll require varying levels of access, but some people will be able to get back to that. If something's going to be text, then you can eventually get there. And even when you look at, say you encrypt the files, use some sort of symmetric encryption, uh, AES, whatever, where are you, how are you doing this? Are you just using a hard-coded key? Because Android, for example, it's massively easy to just compile the application for the key. So making sure you're storing it securely and not just running with whatever's there is also very important. And then you also need to look at who has access to your data, um, who can modify it. Because it's all well good, so you've stored it well, you've got the sensitive information, it should be fine, but you mark it as full rewritable then anybody can get in there. Maybe they're going to wait for you to encrypt it first, but while it's in there, it's going to be accessible. Maybe you want to save space on a user's device, so you store it to the SD card, but there's no permissions on the SD card, so anybody, any application can use it. If you want to ignore the process communications on the device, if you use the cookbook, you can just send an application that falls. So making sure that access to something is important is equally as important as making sure that it's properly stored. So then just to look at some things that could be useful to an attacker, I mean, going after a custom dictionary is really nice. Most of our products, it's just a usability feature to remember what you typed that's out of the norm. So if you haven't marked your password field as, um, you know, don't save this, then your application is going to go, oh, I don't recognize that word, let's just save it to the custom dictionary. And every application has some access to your custom dictionary, you might even be able to auto the your bank address, so that would be a lot of fun. Then, like I mentioned, the SD card is a FAT32 formatted system usually, and that doesn't support permissions. So, all the systems where you usually set your permissions that, okay, only these people can access it, it's going to go out the window when it's on your SD card. You're also going to search for something you can just unplug the SD card from your phone and plug it into this, which admittedly requires physical access, so you're not going to get a lot of people doing that. Then, you want to look at what's the application storing, and then, like I say, how is it storing it, and how can you get to it? So maybe you've enabled backups on your application, but it's storing the session cookies, so somebody's just got to be able to back up your phone and they can go through these files at their leisure. And then also looking at how long data is available. I mean, some stuff is transient, you don't need it forever. So once you're finished with it, just delete it. If you look at a platform like iOS, by default your applications can't access something when they go to the background. So you operate in the foreground, and then sort of your access is terminated. But there are options that allow you to continue to function in the background. If you've got those, you really need to understand why. I think in the iOS keychain, you can specify, like, so this is available always, this is available only after the first unlock, and everything like that. And you've got to make sure you've tailored your access to whatever the application is doing. And then finally, as I mentioned, if you encrypt files, you really want to make sure you're storing the key properly. So if the key sits with the user, that's wonderful. It's like, Maybe it's one thing to all find cracking, but it depends on how long it is. But at least it's not something you have to ever look to do. Another option might be an open from the server. But anything where you've sort of stored it, maybe in a text file next to a file you're encrypting or hard coded into the source, that's going to become a problem. Okay, so if we move on from storage and we look at some of the permissions your application has. Now, by default, most applications sit where they can do exactly what they need to and nothing more. If you want access to another resource, be it physical or logical, you're actually going to have to request that. And usually if you're storing from some sort of, installing from some sort of app store, it's going to say to the user, okay, application is asking for XYZ permissions. And there are a lot of logical reasons that you would want to access more permissions than you usually do. So say you've got some sort of hiking application, it needs to know your location, it wants to be able to send it to the server, it's perfectly reasonable 
increase those permissions. But the problem is, when your application requests permissions, it doesn't need to become live. It can become a liability, and it can just become very attractive to an attacker because ultimately an attack needs privileged access to the device, and that doesn't mean they need root access. They just need enough privileges to do what they want to do. So I could sort of talk about this one in the face, but I think it's best to explain it through a demonstration. So what I'm going to do now is I'm setting up a wireless access point on my phone so that the device connects, or so that my laptop and the mobile device connect to that. So that would sort of seem like an air, maybe an airport Wi-Fi point, hotel, but well, there's a lot of Wi-Fi access points that we use. Then we have a post-exploitation toolkit called Prosa that I use quite a bit. It's very useful for Android. And I've got a Nexus device. So the Nexus device has Rose Agent installed. And now, admittedly, at the moment, what I've done with it is I've just installed the one with a GUI. So it is very visible. But you do have options that you can install everything. So it's about impossible to see what's going on. Um, that application has been very, very difficult to track. It doesn't show up just anywhere on the device. And I'm running the Droza server on Sorry, how do you spell that? Droza, D-R-O-C-E-R. Oh, oh, Droza. Okay, so this agent just has the record audio on the internet permissions. And if you look at that, that's relatively few permissions. I think most people would probably accept that and not think too much about it. But it's supposed to show up on the sheet. No, it's going to come now. I need to actually hand the device to somebody. So, is there any audience, uh, audience who wants to speak to an Android device? Okay. So, just talk just, just to the device. Just give me two seconds. I'm going to so I'm running one of the built-in post-exportation uh, post capturing models, uh, modules. Okay, I'll just stop. Are you going to hear something? Okay, so just tap into it, say anything you want to. You nearly adopted hacking. <laughs> 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 okay, and with this, I want you to think about the fact how often you're in a meeting and you just have your phone next to you. And, I mean, Okay, at the moment it was open onto the gross application, but you could do this with absolutely nothing showing up. Right, so that's why you have You said that no longer works with that, right? You merely adopted that So, and just to give you an idea, so that clip was a few seconds, and it's 20 kilobytes. I think Droza uses the 3 gp format for your videos, so uh, audio. So you can get somewhere like oh, a month's worth of recordings on like two or three gigs of data. So I mean, if somebody just records your meeting and sort of uploads it, maybe it's a couple of megabytes. How many people are really going to notice that going on their phone? So there's a lot of room for exploitation if there are enough permissions. I mean, you can even do something like capturing the screen, whatever you want. So it becomes very important to make sure that you build things as best you can. Then talking about permissions and access, one of the things we're very commonly see is people who have Java open on their phone. And there's a lot of justification for this. I think the common thing I see online is usually like, I hate that thing, I really want this one, so people just root their phones. <laughs> but also, so interestingly enough, I don't know if you know, but a lot of the jailbreaks you see come from China, and that's because a lot of the Chinese apps get rejected by the iOS app store. So they have their own app store, but you need to be able to sideload applications. So you have a lot of people who just want to be able to sideload their applications and so they don't break their phones so they can get there. You also have things like getting operating system updates. I install on Jellybean, and 
and can now any hope that even getting to an earlier version or a later version of Android. So, and also just removing low wear, I think those are the two reasons I could identify with most. But the major problem with this is actually that it completely breaks the security model. So here I'm going to give you an example with Android, and I've listed the contents in the private data directory. So you'll see the output, so it gives you some permissions on the left, and then it names a user and a group. So for those of you who are not familiar with Android, or Linux actually, because Android is a Linux-based system, you get three permissions on any file. So read allows you to access a file, write allows you to write to it, um, what read allows you to see the contents, execute allows you to execute the contents of that file. Read files have a D in the front, that just means they're a directory. A directory is a file that contains a list of files. So being able to read it means you can see what files it points to, being able to write to it means you can add a file there, and being able to execute it basically means you can traverse it. So now, Android also sort of acknowledges like a user group other system. So a user is the person who owns the file, and you can define certain permissions for somebody who owns the file. And in the columns there, you'll see that the first three bits define the permissions of the owner of the file. Then, I mean, feasibly a file doesn't just need to be accessed by its owner, it might be other people who need it. So you have your group permissions. So anybody who's added to the group associated with that file will be able to have whatever permissions have been assigned in the second column. So you'll see in this case they can read the file and they can traverse the directory, but that's it, they can't write anything to it. And then finally you get the rest of the world. You sort of say, well, there's one one with the rest of the world here, and two other. And in the case of the private data directory, it usually just allows you to traverse the now, when you read the details, long story short, in the end you get to run as the computer. So, however you choose to get there, you can see things down like this. So, they can rewrite those permissions if they feel like it. They can just access the files. The pseudo command will let you do almost anything on the device. If you've mounted a, ses a section of memory that's rewritten, the root user can unmount it and remount it. So the second you introduce the root user, this whole model is broken. And a lot of the application sandboxing and everything you see in mobile applications is going to be able to say, okay, so this application is this user, so they're only allowed access to this resource. So that's why routine device completely messes up the security system. And then finally, to take a complete jump, I want to look at the communications on the device. So mobile communications, I think, is very important, maybe to a degree more important than a or more vulnerable than a normal wired network. And that's because how many people do you know who actually permanently just use mobile data? I mean, we go to a cafe, they say they've got free Wi Fi, you can make it and they're happy. And it's so easy to just set up a Wi Fi hotspot. I mean, you could make a rope Wi Fi, it's set free and you can get people using it. So the data you transmit becomes very, very important. If you're sending it in clear text, anybody who controls that access point is going to be able to see it. Logging the messages that go through it, it's going to appear in those logs. So, you definitely don't want to get it. So, at a bare minimum, you sort of want HTTPS. But even that's not necessarily safe. So, if I get to install my root certificate on your phone, then you will use me as a proxy. You won't know that I am proxy. I'll be able to manually commit a root. And that would be pretty simple. I mean, if Wi Fi access point said, okay, we just need you to log in for this, please provide your credentials and install this. Okay, a lot of people are going to say that's dodgy and go away. but there's enough of them who would accept that. And what you also see is sometimes configuration issues or implementation faults in SSL. So one of the things I've seen with Android is you get a trust manager class where you do a lot of your certificate checks. And one of the things that Stack Overflow, somebody's having a problem with the connections, is like, no, just delete these checks out of trust manager and everything works. So they are literally doing nothing in their SSL code, which is useless. You also get bugs like the iOS go to fail. So go to fail was pretty interesting. Um, basically, when iOS checks your certificates, it sort of says, check this, and then if it's true, go to fail. And then fail is a section that handles the code, deals with the errors. So at one point, they had two go to fails. So one within the if statement and one outside of it. There's so one, one <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> but basically, you went to the go to fail point, and you hadn't generated any errors. So the error handling code went, you're fine, and proceeded with the communication. <coughs> hadn't finished um, checking the certificate. So you could manually do that. And that's why the best thing to look at with a mobile connection is actually pinning it. Now pinning is the process of saying, this is the certificate I expect, this is the certificate chain I expect. If anything's different, kill the communication, just don't continue with it. There was a call on Android certificate, don't you? Yes, because they used to um, 
and they will install malicious applications. They want to get their feeds so they will do it. So a big part of any system where you want to secure a mobile environment or mobile device is to make sure your users understand why you're doing this. So even if you're just implementing policy, you say, you know, company policy is this on any devices connected to our network. Make sure your users understand why each of those restrictions is in place so they don't just bypass them as it suits them. And then, so rather than looking at the general device and the um, mobile environment, I also want to look at how you secure a mobile application. So there's some little things you can do that are quite quick, like code checks. <coughs> so you can check that when your application is being backgrounded that it's not displaying sensitive information, either by turning off the display or detecting backgrounding action and sort of popping up splash screen. You can make sure this is backing up sensitive data. I mean, it's a flag in the Android manifest. Backup equals false and fine. You can check that your application is not debuggable. So debugging is a problem because you can write in the context of the application. So again, you probably need physical access to the front, but if you can connect a debugger to the front, you can do anything on the device from within the context of that application. So you can create code, if you want to access the microphone and it's got the microphone permission, you can do that. And finally, check the permissions for the Then also look at your storage, and not just what is stored by the application, but also what your packaging of the application. So an Android APK is essentially is a file, you can unzip it, um, and there's a folder in there called assets, and anything that you put through, like with your application will be stored in assets. So if you've got SSH keys because you're connected to an SSH server, those are accessible. And if you've got the private key, which you're going to need, then, yeah, that's a problem. Okay, then also look at things. There's a lot of functionality you see in an application which you need for development, but you don't necessarily need for production. So, any comments in the code, debug logging, and everything, you're never going to access a mobile user's debug logging, or it's very unlikely. So, you can remove that. Um, making sure that if you disable SSL checks because it's a pain in the neck in a testing environment, quite frankly, that you do re enable it for production. And make sure that there's any test functionality or accounts that those go. Then also look at slowing down your attackers. Because a mobile device is in the hands of an end user and everything is controlled from that endpoint, they are eventually going to be able to get to anything in the device if they really, really, really want to. They will be able to get there. They will be able to spend months to reverse engineer your application. So most people who are going to attack your applications are not actually, they want to get to their goals as quickly as possible. So they're going to go for the easiest part, the one that gives them access they need, and it's really easy to compromise. So there are a few steps you can put in place just to make your application less attractive. So source code obfuscation is a big thing. And within that, so you can model the logic, but for me, it's always a problem when I have to assess an application is if they've like, encrypted the strings or done anything to make the strings unrecognizable. Because if there's root detection and they're looking for SU somewhere, I don't need to worry about anything else once I've found that, I'm good. But if I can't read the strings, it makes life a lot more difficult. Then also including root for jailbreak detection. This is just sort of because most of the people who are going to be attacking the phone probably going to want to run their own root device or something. So it helps, but it's not like a catch -up. And then some sort of attacking and debug protection. So within that, again, if it's running on the user side, we will be able to patch this out. But there are some actions you can take. The easiest will probably be if you detect somebody's tampered with your code, like you've signed it and suddenly the application file doesn't match the signature, or you detect something connected on some other port, you just delete all data related to the user. You say, okay, no, this is it, delete everything. It might frustrate you either, but more likely than not, you're still on their phone, you can't get this information, and it's no longer accessible to your You could also, I suppose, sort of connect out to a server if you've got an internet connection, but trying to isolate one device you become a little bit of a problem. And then as much as your users need to be familiar with um, how to keep their devices secure, you also need to make sure that developers actually have the opportunity to become familiar with security. Because it doesn't help that like, you get pen testing in the testing stage of development and suddenly they get thrown all these new requirements. You know, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Um, they need to be familiar with the state of every stage. Have requirements gathering where you actually get useful requirements, not like make this device secure. <laughs> and you're really like, okay, how? So ensuring that developers know what they can do, how they can go about things, um, and the best way to approach everything, maybe having secure code repositories that they can always reference is very, very useful. And so just in summary for what we've covered, um, we sort of looked at the attacks and who might be attacking the device, how the capacity might be limited by something and what might be of interest, and sort of how to deter uh, 
majority of people. Maybe not everyone, like I say, you won't catch everything. There's some people operating to people that can't stop. But at least it's a certain majority. Then we looked at how user behavior and social education can actually have a big impact on the security of the solution. Yeah. Any questions? No, 
but it, there's no long way. And the thing is, like I say, it runs with the user's or it runs with the user, so mm -hmm. everything's going to be able to bypass your checks given enough time. The thing is just to make it long enough that. As soon as there's like static algorithm, the checks are like, but isn't is there also a massive problem precisely to that the stage five virus is not being properly addressed by the Android manufacturers at all? It's not really the virus, but only well, the stage five virus. Well, that's what I'm saying. But it's basically not being, it's not, it hasn't been addressed at all. Right. Well, so that, that's the problem people are about to get to actually. I mean, it has been addressed now, but not all devices yeah. that aren't rooted are getting updated as a problem. Yeah, and the thing is, like, a lot of it depends on who the provider is. So, I think they made it accessible yep. first to North American guys, for example. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that goes out and everything. So, it depends on where you are. I don't think I had an update on my phone in 18 years, which is very long. Yeah. My phone uh, is uh, has, <laughs> has your company um, seen it in the wild? Because no. there's some, some, some of the data as to actually being seen in the wild. I haven't seen it myself, but I'm not even involved with the research. Um, so, okay. uh, so, as you said, my phone's also not had an update in years. And at least if you have a Sony, they're quite up to date and quick. And the other problem is as well with Samsung, you've got so much bloat where you can't get off at all. You actually need to read the device and put on a new firmware. But at the same time, can you even trust something like Sign Engine Mod or something that someone's doing in their spare time? You know, adding all kinds of stuff to it as well. That's the only one against open source software. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. Like, of course, people works with me, but we write open source software. It's not. Don't look at this. Yeah, okay. Let's put it this way. I have old Sony, and they took Sign Engine Mod and some other guy in his spare time modded it to work on that little phone. Now, I trust this sign engine mod guys a little bit more, but I can't just run that straight on a really old phone. I, I have to have it slightly... Yeah, the only way you can really get uh, Android code is you can completely trust it if you, like, sync the repo yourself and then, like, make your own And then, like, I'm reading it after this. Is it worth trying? I mean, you've already written the device. Can you go and change all the permissions and fix it? Without being... Like... Uh, okay. I don't know, like... That would be a lot of effort, but you can still... When you've rooted it, I mean, you'll see where user can access everything once your application will be able to see. You can actually strip, like, permissions on a permission basis from apps, but they will crash. When you edit, like, packages with packages and fix them all, yeah. where it's full submission, you can actually strip out, like, I don't want you to access my internet, I don't want you to access my internet. You can strip it up from each app as, as you like, but it will probably crash that. And I think at a time, if you had a picture like that, the big number was like, no, it's going to break all my apps, and you're going to figure out. Except, don't they marshmallow want to introduce where sort of your application runs with the information and asks for it? So you have by default to sign all the information. It's just a Yeah, the whole idea was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>